You ready? You want me to send us live? I just did. I'll let you take over for me, or I can take over. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chuck Sammons. I'm with the Ohio Geological Survey. I want to welcome you all today to our next edition of Ohio Rock Talks. And today we have a special presentation in celebration of National Fossil Day, which is part of the Earth Science Week week-long celebration. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I want to welcome my colleagues, David Rohrbach, who's going to be behind the scenes uh, helping us answer questions and sharing information. And our presenter today is Mark Peter, who is the paleontologist at the Division of Geological Survey. And he's going to be giving a talk on fossils of the Columbus limestone and where you can view them in Ohio. So I want to remind you that we have the Q&A box available to you to share your questions or comments. I did post a link in there uh, right off the bat to the official National Fossil Day website. The National Fossil Day campaign is uh, managed by the National Park Service. So there's a lot of great information on their website and I encourage you to check that out. So Mark, I'm going to ask you to uh, share your webinar and we'll get started. Okay, Chuck, can you see my screen now? We're good to go, my friend. All right, welcome everyone. So my name is Mark Peter, as uh, Chuck said, and I've been with the Division of Geological Survey uh, since 2017. And one of the first project I was assigned was to create a guide to the fossils of the Columbus State House at the Ohio Capitol of downtown Columbus. And I've worked on this project off and on uh, for the last couple years, and I'm happy to say that the guide is almost ready for publication. So what I'm gonna talk about today are some of the things I learned along the way. Um, I'm gonna talk about the Columbus limestone uh, and the kind of fossils that you can find in it. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the places around Ohio that you can see it. So first, let me wish you a happy Fossil Day. So October 14th, 2020 is National Fossil Day. National Fossil Day uh, is a collaboration between the National Park Service, American Geosciences Institute, and many community partners. Uh, the first one was held in 2010, and every year they have an artwork contest. Uh, you can see some of the uh, uh, artwork, the winning artwork uh, to the left there, um, including Megalograptus, a big giant sea scorpion uh, from, uh, from southern Ohio. So before I talk about the Columbus limestone, uh, I thought I'd just talk about what limestone is in general. So limestone is a sedimentary rock. It can be a chemical precipitate uh, such as stalagmites or stalactites in caves, or travertines at hot springs. But uh, the Columbus limestone and many of the limestones in Ohio are actually sediments that are composed of the shells and skeletons of animals. And most of these are invertebrate animals. Uh, there are also some plants um, and tiny fragmented parts of calcareous algae um, actually help make up some of the limey mud that cements it all together. So where do you find limestones forming? So today, uh, limestones uh, form mainly in um, shallow, warm, clear seawater uh, or on beaches or land uh, near those environments, uh, such as those that are found in the Bahamas today. What you see there is a carbonate platform um, and the, the Bahamas Bank platform actually is uh, quite thick. It's several miles thick, and it's existed since the, at least the Cretaceous period. So the Columbus limestone uh, is quite old. Uh, it's from the early to middle Devonian period and is approximately 405 to 390 million years old. So you notice I have a partial time scale 
And one of the things I want to point out is that the first dinosaurs uh, don't appear until much, much later. So we're talking pre-dinosaur times. Now, Ohio is not, uh, was not 400 million years ago where it is today. So you may have heard of plate tectonics and uh, that continents move around, usually at a rate of a few centimeters uh, per year. Well, in 400 million years, uh, the continents can move quite a bit. And Ohio was actually located south of the equator at this time in tropical to subtropical latitudes probably somewhere between 25 and 35 degrees south latitude. And you'll notice on the map, if you look at Ohio, you'll see that, you know, western Ohio and, and into Indiana, there's some very shallow water, even possibly some land. And to the east, there is a deep basin. And farther east still, there are some, uh, the Proto-Appalachian Mountains. So if you could go back uh, and don some scuba gear and go back 400 million years ago, uh, this is what it might look like. You'd be in a shallow sunlit sea. Um, it'd be probably uh, high visibility, very clear water. Uh, you'd see an abundance of invertebrate life. Now, what this picture doesn't show is that there were actually quite a, a, a diverse array of fishes uh, in living at the time. Um, and I'll talk about those later. But you, you notice there are familiar things like corals and maybe some unfamiliar things like these straight shelled cephalopods, which were squid like animals, or the trilobites in the foreground. So where does the Columbus limestone occur at the surface in Ohio? It actually occurs in a very sort of narrow band about five miles wide on average that extends from central Ohio all the way up to Lake Erie and includes the Marblehead Peninsula and Kelly's Island. So these are the dark orange areas inside the red boxes on the map. You'll also notice the small red box near Bell Fountain, Ohio. Well, Fountain is, uh, there's an outlier there. An outlier is younger rock surrounded by older rock, and that's an erosional remnant. So there used to be Columbus limestone extending in western Ohio, but it, it is eroded. In the cross section below the map, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but there's actually a thin line of that dark orange that extends uh, and dips into the subsurface to the east. So the Columbus limestone underlies uh, the surface rocks in eastern Ohio. So the Columbus limestone uh, is what the Ohio State House is, is made from. Uh, it, the stone that was used in the Ohio State House was quarried from a quarry uh, about three miles west of uh, the current capital. And uh, it was called the Sullivan Quarry. Later, the state purchased it in 1845, and then it was called the State Quarry. Um, they actually had railroad lines uh, running from the quarry uh, and up uh, along Broad Street uh, to bring the, the giant blocks of limestone to construct the exterior walls. Uh, the, the actual name Columbus Limestone was actually first used to describe rocks uh, that were encountered in drilling an artesian well at the Ohio Capitol. Uh, William W. Mather, who was our first state geologist, um, uh, just before his death, he wrote a report uh, describing the rocks that they encountered while drilling that well, and he called it the Columbus Limestone. So actually, the Ohio capital is the type locality for the Columbus limestone. Now Mather's description of Columbus limestone um, actually included what we now call the, uh, the Delaware limestone that overlies the Columbus limestone. So the Delaware limestone wasn't distinguished from the Columbus limestone until 1873, and that was by J.S. Newberry, pictured at right, who was our second state geologist. We'll talk more about Newberry later. 
The Delaware limestone is generally thinner bedded and it has more shale than the Columbus limestone, which is more massive and is a fairly pure limestone. So major economic uses of the Columbus limestone include uh, building stone. Um, dimension stone is, is stone that's cut to certain dimensions and used in building. Uh, crushed stone, uh, much of which is used for construction aggregate, uh, which is used for uh, you know, paving roads and, and things. Um, and because the lime content is very high, uh, Columbus limestone can be used to make Portland cement and also uh, to treat soils. Uh, it's an agricultural lime product. Now shown at left is Marble Cliff Quarry. Um, this was opened in the mid 1900s and it, uh, until the mid 1980s, it was the largest limestone quarry in the world. Now the Columbus limestone, um, it overlies Silurian rocks and it's overlain by the Delaware limestone, the Olentangy shale and the Ohio shale. And the Ohio shale is, is uh, getting to be late Devonian. Uh, it's been subdivided into members by various authors in various schemes. This one follows wells of 1947 and applies to the rocks as they're exposed in central Ohio. So the lower member is more dolomitic, has relatively few fossils. Uh, by dolomitic, I mean it has a higher magnesium uh, to calcium ratio. The middle member, the Eversol member, contains a lot of chert. So chert, which you may know as flint, is microcrystalline quartz. And it's actually pretty pervasive throughout the Columbus limestone. In fact, the Columbus limestone was sometimes referred to as the corniferous. Corniferous is an antiquated term that means full of chert. The upper member, the Delhi member, uh, is the member that was quarried for the Columbus uh, State House. Um, it tends to be um, more crystalline um, and it, it actually kind of uh, is reminiscent of marble uh, uh, when you see it exposed in a, in a vertical wall. And that's why Marble Cliff Quarry uh, uh, got it. That's how it got its name. Uh, the Delhi member, this upper member, is uh, is a lighter, you know, gray to buff color, and it's just chock full of fossils. There are some contemporaries of the Columbus limestone. Uh, one I'd like to highlight um, is the Jeffersonville limestone, uh, which is uh, exposed in Indiana and Kentucky. And it's ex spectacularly exposed at the Falls of Ohio in Clarksville, Indiana, which is across the Ohio River from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, this is a state park of Indiana that you can go and visit. And when the river is not too high, you can actually walk out on Devonian reefs and you can see corals uh, that uh, are in the original place where they where they grew. Uh, and you can see many invertebrate fossils as well. There's a nice interpretive center and statues of Lewis and Clark, because this is where they met before they embarked on their expedition to explore the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, there are other uh, contemporaries of the Columbus limestone, such as the Onondaga Formation, uh, which is well exposed in Ontario and New York State. So the Ohio State House is actually one of the most fossiliferous buildings in the world. And um, as I said, I was uh, asked to write a guide to the fossils of the Columbus State House. Uh, this was originally um, going to be a small trifold brochure. But I found a lot more to talk about, so it ended up being a 38 page booklet instead. Um, this was a, a collaboration uh, between many people. Um, I have many people uh, to uh, to acknowledge. Uh, I, I won't do that uh, right now, uh, but I do want to mention uh, a few. 
And um, so first uh, is Dale Nedevic, who's pictured at left. So the inspiration for uh, the booklet is actually um, live guided tours that were offered twice a year, usually around Earth Day and National Fossil Day, uh, for about a quarter of a century. So Dale Nedevic, who is the curator of the Orton Geological Museum at Ohio State, along with survey staff, uh, and the Columbus, uh, the Capitol uh, Square Review and Advisory Board, uh, down, folks down at the State House, uh, we would work together to lead these tours. And you can see there are participants of all ages. So here's a glimpse inside the booklet. This is from the guide portion, where I actually uh, describe the major fossil groups. And all of the pictures that are included there are uh, were taken at the uh, at the state house. In the back of the booklet, there is a, a self-guided tour that you can take. Now you'll notice that some of these fossils uh, are black and white. Those are not from the Columbus limestone. Those are from another fossiliferous limestone uh, called the Crown Point limestone. That's a bit older from the Ordovician period. Uh, and was quarried on Isle Lamotte in Lake Champlain, uh, Vermont. But you can see that we've uh, mapped the locations of, of the fossils, and then we've described where you can find them. So our graphic uh, designer, Jeremy Gladden, uh, redesigned these maps, and, and he did the layout for the booklet, and I'm very happy with how it came out. One of my favorite parts of the new booklet uh, is the back. I call it the paleontologist toolkit. Um, and you can see we have some sample labels uh, and uh, some photographic scale bars and some spaces to take notes or make sketches. So we want to encourage people to start thinking like scientists. One of the problems with making the booklet was that most of the fossils were just cut through along with the rock so that you see a cross section of the fossil. So it looks like a rather two dimensional thing. Now, if you're an invertebrate paleontologist, you might have some idea of what the uh, you know, animal might look like, but your average uh, uh, newcomer to this you know, might not. So what we did is we employed a graphic artist to um, help illustrate the fossils. So on the left, you see a photograph of the fossil. In the middle is a drawing of a specimen loaned uh, to us uh, from the Orton Museum. And on the right is the artist's uh, reconstruction of what the living animal would have looked like. Because most of these fossils are just the hard shells uh, of the animals. The soft parts like the tentacles and eyes and the head, you know, would have decayed. So here uh, the artist brings the animals back to life. So here's the artist, uh, Madison Perry. Uh, she came to us from the Division of Wildlife. So she already had experience drawing live animals, um, but this was the first time she was drawing uh, fossil animals. So this is uh, one of her um, uh, sketch pads with concept sketches where she's kind of working out, um, you know, how the animals are put together. And the end result of a crinoid, a type of echinoderm animal related to a sea star is at far right. So in the process of making the book, uh, we came up with these, Madison created these beautiful drawings. So we assembled them together into a frameable poster. Uh, it's 22 by 28 inches and is available now from our Geologic Records Center. So we'll put some information in the chat uh, to tell you how you can order this poster. So let me get to the fossils themselves. I'm gonna start with one that's probably not very charismatic, but it's actually very important in what it tells us. So these are the reproductive structures of some green algae. So these are called, um, the green algae uh, is called a caraphyte, um, and this is, these are the oogonia, these are the female reproductive structures. They were very small spheres of, uh, made of calcium carbonate, uh, calcite, and um, these things uh, became detached from uh, from the uh, 
the, the, the main uh, body of algae, uh, they could be transported some distance from where they were actually growing. Um, and that's part of the point is that they, they are supposed to be uh, dis, uh, a method of dispersal. But the interesting thing about caraphytes is that modern caraphytes all occur in freshwater or brackish water. Um, and fresh water, to have a large supply of freshwater or brackish water meant that you had to have nearby land. So we don't know how exactly how far these uh, could have been transported, but it's likely that there was land uh, somewhere nearby. There's other evidence of land too, such as spores from land plants and this uh, form genus called Silophytides. So Silophytides um, represented some uh, vascular land plants uh, that uh, occurred, uh, they were some of the earliest land plants that occurred in the late Silurian and through the Devonian. And they were very different from modern plants. Uh, they had stems that were cylindrical and branching, but they had no true roots or leaves. But again, this is another clue that land was somewhere nearby. These could have drifted for a while before they were buried and, and, uh, and preserved as fossils. But again, probably there was land nearby. There's other geologic evidence too, such as dried out mud cracks um, and uh, channel forms, which probably uh, uh, formed in an inner tidal area um, and some ancient soil horizons. So one of, the, um, one of the interesting things about Columbus limestone is that there are uh, a number of what paleontologists call bone beds. So vertebrate uh, fossils are in general uh, not super common, uh, except in these uh, bone beds where they're, where they're extremely common and concentrated. Um, what we think happened is that there were sediments that were actually uh, winnowed away, um, and what was left behind were the erosion-resistant calcium phosphate uh, bones and teeth, uh, and um, also scales of, of fishes. Uh, so on the left is uh, Dale Nidovic, who I mentioned earlier from the Orton Museum. He's a vertebrate paleontologist and was very excited to uh, study these bone beds. This was one that was exposed during a uh, construction site for a brief time um, and then was later covered over. Mark? Yes. We do have a question that came in. The question is, what is a channel form? Uh, so these are um, basically like you see um, on, on a lot of like spur and groove reefs today, um, where there are channels that are have been eroded in the limestone. So the limestone was deposited and then sometime later, um, you know, maybe sea level dropped, uh, you know, a, a little bit in it, uh, or I'm sorry, sea level, yes, dropped a little bit and it became closer to shore, maybe in the inner tidal zone. So you have tides coming in and out and they, they wear grooves in weak spots in the limestone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So in the bone beds, you find remains of uh, fishes. Um, one of them is Onychidus sigmoides. So this was a lobe finned fish that would have been uh, uh, related to uh, coelacanths. Um, a coelacanth is a, kind of a, a, a fish with uh, fleshy fins um, that they sometimes call a living fossil that still lives today. Uh, but it would have been shaped kind of like a moray eel and probably lived a similar lifestyle. It was probably an ambush predator. And one of the interesting things about Onychidus is that it had a pair of teeth whorls uh, that were situated between the lower jaws and they were retractable. So basically the idea is that Onychidus would lunge out and, um, and grab its prey and then retract the tooth whorls to kind of pull it into the mouth. So individual teeth of Onychidus are common in those bone beds I showed previously. 
There were also um, some extinct fish uh, called acanthodians or spiny sharks. One of the distinctive things about the acanthodians uh, is they had these very large stout spines, particularly on the dorsal and the pectoral fins. The one at left is about a foot long, and so it would have indicated an acanthodian uh, that was maybe six feet long or so. I have a picture of J.S. Newberry here because um, he was our st second state geologist. Um, he was an amazing fellow. He was a physician by training originally, uh, but he was also a very competent paleontologist. And he described uh, many of the fossil fishes from Ohio, including this acanthodian uh, Macaracanthus uh, newberry uh, uh, that is featured here. Another type of fossil fish that is also extinct, uh, these along with the acanthodians went extinct at the end of the Devonian period, were placoderms. Placoderms were armored fish the head and the, um, the thorax, uh, the front, uh, the area of the body just behind the head, uh, were armored with these bony plates. But the rear of the animal was just uh, probably cartilage. It's not preserved as a fossil generally. Um, these placoderms came in all shapes and sizes. Most were moderate size, like macropedalictes here, but some got quite large such as Dunkleosteus. The Dunkleosteus teruli uh, did not occur in the Columbus limestone, but rather in the overlying Ohio shale. And it lived uh, up until the end of the Devonian period uh, when it also became extinct. So based on a jawbone from the largest known Dunkleosteus, uh, estimates of its length have been made at up to 29 feet long. So we have an angler there for scale. And there's actually a bill before the Ohio legislature currently that would make Dunkleosteus our state fossil fish. So hopefully that will legislation will, uh, will make it into law and then we'll have a second state fossil symbol. We already have one, the state invertebrate fossil, which is the large trilobite, Isotelus, uh, that is a trilobite that could be over 15 inches long is found down near Cincinnati, Ohio. I'll talk more about trilobites next. So trilobites are, are some of the fossil collectors favorites. Uh, they're extinct. Uh, they lived during the Paleozoic area, era, but they uh, became extinct uh, by the end of the Permian period. So this one is Coronora aspectans uh, at left. This is one of the Columbus limestone ones. Now trilobites are, are so named because uh, they have, th the name means three-lobed animal and it's named for the three lengthwise divisions of the body. They probably lived a lot like horseshoe crabs. Uh, trilobites would have uh, swam or crawled, you know, near the bottom, many of them, although some of them uh, swam in open water. Um, so trilobites had soft parts uh, like legs and antennae and gills that were under the uh, their dorsal exoskeleton, which is basically the shell on their back. So that shell on their back is what is preserved as a fossil generally. And trilobites um, could roll up like roly-polies today to protect themselves. <clears throat> so here is um, Coronora. Uh, this is a large trilobite that occurs in the Columbus limestone and can be up to about eight inches long. Now, Dale Nidovic from the Orton Museum noticed something interesting. He said he had a whole drawer full of Coronora tails, but almost no heads or bodies. So this is still a little bit of a mystery. Although I think it might have something to do with the fact that the tail presented a large flat area and created a weakness in the rock. And so possibly um, the fact that we have more tails is related to the way the rock breaks around it. There were other trilobites in the Columbus limestone as well. Uh, actually, there were about six genera. Uh, two of the others are Odontocephalus, 
uh, which uh, means toothed head. And you can see that it's at the left and it's got uh, kind of tooth like projections on the front of the head. And via fake cups um, uh, to the right. Complete trilobites are actually pretty rare in the Columbus limestone. Mainly what you'll find are heads or tails. In the state house, this is the most complete trilobite that we've found so far. And it's in a second uh, floor um, a northwest stairwell. Uh, and it's one of the stops included uh, in the booklet. OK, let's talk now about my probably one of my favorite fossils, and it's the group that I study. These are crinoids. So crinoids are echinoderm animals. Uh, they're related to sea stars, sand dollars, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, brittle stars. Um, but they were sometimes called sea lilies because when the arms are closed up, they kind of resembled the flower. And indeed, crinoids come in quite a array of colors. Um, the ones to, that are living today are extremely colorful, and there's reason to believe that the fossil ones may have been too. You have the stocked echinoderms or the sea lilies, and they live in deep water today. But in the past, like in the Devonian, uh, we have uh, we know that they lived in much shallower water. Um, the unstocked varieties, which are pictured above, are called feather stars, and those occur uh, from very shallow water, only a few feet deep, uh, all the way to uh, the abyssal depths of the ocean. There are two um, crinoids that are somewhat common in the Columbus limestone. Magistocrinus, uh, which is the one we our artist brought back to life for us, uh, and Dilatocrinus, uh, the one uh, pictured below right, uh, which has a, a pentagram uh, a pattern on the bottom, so it's quite recognizable. Magistocrinus, on the other hand, uh, was a very spiny crinoid. Now, generally, you don't find complete crinoids. Generally, all you find are sections of the stem as pictured at lower left. Um, and if you take a magnifying glass and you actually look very closely at the Columbus limestone, uh, you can see that it's actually made up uh, in, in many places uh, largely of the stems of echinoderms, such as crinoids. Another kind of echinoderm that you may find in the Columbus limestone are blastoids. Now, blastoids are an extinct group. Um, one of the more common blastoids, Eleocrinus, kind of was, had the size and shape of a hickory nut. Uh, it was a rather atypical looking blastoid. Uh, the blastoid at top left uh, is a little bit more typical looking for a blastoid. So there were other invertebrate fossils that you might uh, find more recognizable, such as snails. So this was a, uh, they're also called gastropods. So the, the one at the left is Spiny platycerus. It was a very spiny gastropod that had a very uh, unique lifestyle. As juveniles, these gastropods would climb up a crinoid stem or possibly a blastoid stem. They, so they go up the stems of those echinoderms and then they would sit on top of the crinoid or blastoid uh, and they would position themselves over the anus of the animal and feed off its waste. That's what we call coprophagus uh, uh, animals that do that. And this uh, snail would have actually uh, lived its entire life on top of that crinoid. And um, even the outer uh, margin of the shell actually conforms to uh, the shape of the top of the crinoid. There were other types of gastropods too. The one at the left, Loxonema, was probably an herbivore that grazed on algae. The one at the right, um, as an adult, probably lived more like an oyster and, and basically filtered its, uh, stayed in one place and filtered uh, food from the water. Now these guys, rostroconchs, are ones you may not recognize. So this is an extinct group. 
These were mollusks, so they were related to, uh, you know, the gastropods, uh, to bivalves, uh, to cephalopods, and other mollusks. But unlike a bivalve, even though they had two valves, they didn't articulate on a hinge and they couldn't open and close uh, at will. Instead, the two valves were fused together. We don't really know how rostroconchs lived. We think they lived partially buried in the sediment. Uh, they may have been deposit feeders, they may have been suspension feeders, we're really not sure. Roster conchs are fairly rare um, uh, over most of the world, but Ohio is actually one of the best places to find them. And this genus, Horicardia, is named for Richard Hoare, who was a uh, paleontologist at Bowling Green State University and studied these animals. So we have familiar things like bivalves. Um, generally, the bivalves that are preserved in the Columbus limestone are only preserved as internal molds or external molds. If you see the photo at right, you'll see that there's a void in the rock, and that's where the original shell was, but it dissolved. Occasionally, we do get original shell preservation in bivalves. Another mollusk uh, are the cephalopods. So uh, some of the cephalopods that we find in the Columbus limestone are nautiloids, and they were related to the, the uh, nautiluses that are living today. So at right, the photo you see is uh, uh, the chambered nautilus above and the golden nautilus uh, below. Uh, and these are uh, living fossils because their shell has remained virtually unchanged for 500 million years. At lower left, you can see one that's been cut open and you can see that it has many, many chambers. Um, and the terminal chamber is called the living chamber. And that's where the bulk of the animal, including the tentacles and eyes and sharp beak were. Uh, there would have been a tube connecting all of these chambers. Uh, the cross section, the cut they made doesn't show it. But this tube connected the chambers. It was lined with living tissue. And the animal could control the ratio of gas to water in the chambers. And so if it wanted to rise in the water, uh, it, would, um, it would add, uh, it would expel water. And so there'd be more air in the chambers. And if it wanted to sink, um, uh, it would uh, allow more water to enter the chambers. So they could actually rise or sink in the water like submarines and expend very little energy. One of the most charismatic fossils in the state house is Goldringia cyclops. So it's a type of this uh, a nautiloid cephalopod. And the name honors Winifred Goldring. Winifred Goldring studied Devonian fossils of New York State. She was the first woman ever to be appointed as a state uh, paleontologist or any state geologist position for that matter. One of the interesting things about Goldringia is the frills that surround the shell. And Dale Nidovic there is pointing out one of his favorite fossils in the state house. It's a specimen of Goldringia that clearly shows uh, the frills. Now in cross section, they look more like spines. But on specimens that are excavated from the rock, you can see that they actually went all the way around the shell. We're not really sure what the purpose of the frills were. If you took Goldringia or another nautiloid and you unrolled the shell, um, you'd have these straight shell uh, uh, nautiloid cephalopods, which are now extinct, called orthocones. Uh, there's a reconstruction of one at lower left. Again, these were squid like animals. And orthocones had to deposit uh, mineral deposits of calcite uh, in the chambers to balance the shell, because otherwise the shell would be buoyant with the tip up and they would just be bobbing around like bobbers. Brachiopods are one of the most common fossils in the state house and in Ohio carbonate rocks in general. So brachiopods are a group that superficially resemble bivalves. They had two shells, but the shell symmetry was very different. And there wasn't much meat inside of a brachiopod either. 
So basically they were filter feeders. Uh, they'd lived most of their life in one place, just filtering the seawater. Brachiopod shells were made of the mineral calcite, which is geologically stable over time. So generally uh, in limestones, you find the actual brachiopod shells. There are many varieties in the state house. The one on the left, Leptina, is a easily recognizable one because it's got very strong uh, concentric growth rings. Sometimes brachiopods actually form geodes, uh, like the one in the center, uh, the center bottom one, uh, which is a geode with crystals of calcite in it. Another common fossil are bryozoans. Bryozoans uh, were colonial animals and they built a communal skeleton as coral does, but the bryozoan animals themselves were much, much smaller than coral polyps. So the little tiny feeding zoids, uh, which you can see at lower right, uh, would generate currents using hair-like cilia on their tentacles. Um, so they would actually create a current that would flow through the mesh like bryozoan, and they would feed on the baffled currents on the lee side of the bryozoan colony. In the state house, uh, there's a really good bryozoan in the Broad Street steps. Uh, the large photo at right, the white branching structure is the bryozoan. And then there's just an incidental snail that happened to be preserved uh, along with it. The one at the left, you notice it has a lot of little windowed like uh, openings. Now those are not where the animals live. They actually lived in much smaller openings. But those openings um, uh, kind of reminded uh, somebody of windows. So these are called fenestrate bryozoans. Uh, the Latin word fenestra uh, means window. So we also had actual corals. And Columbus limestone had over 70 described species of coral. So at the right is a modern coral. Uh, this picture was taken in the Bahamas. Um, and at left, you can see the living coral polyps. Um, so that, again, they had a community uh, framework or skeleton, but individual animals, um, the individual polyps, uh, each had a, a ring of stinging tentacles. And they could feed heterotrophically, meaning they could eat other animals. Uh, but they also, within their tissues, uh, uh, harbor photosynthetic uh, symbionts, a type of algae. And the corals actually derive much of their energy from these photosynthetic symbionts. <clears throat> we don't know if that is true for the fossil corals or not, although there is some evidence that it might be. So, these are an extinct type of coral called rugose corals. Rugose is Latin for, uh, rugosis uh, is uh, the word, Latin word rugosis means wrinkled. And you can see on the reconstruction of the coral at left that the, there were the growth rings gave it a wrinkled appearance. When you find these solitary rugose corals, uh, we generally call them horn corals uh, because uh, farmers, uh, when they found them, thought that they resembled cow's horns. We also get a lot of people submit these to us for identification, thinking they might be dinosaur teeth, but they're actually these horn corals. There were also colonial rugose corals. So these um, were a, a series of adjoined tubes, so a whole bunch of tubes right next to each other, and at the top of each tube, there was a single coral polyp. So that animal with the ring of tentacles. The, the one at right, Hexogonaria, is probably more recognizable to many people as Petoskey stones. So Petoskey stones are named for Petoskey, Michigan, in northern Michigan, <clears throat> where they naturally erode from the limestone uh, along Lake Michigan. And they get tumbled by the waves, um, and rounded, and then the locals polish, put a fine polish on them and either sell them as jewelry or um, you know, maybe as a paperweight, such as the one that President Obama had on his desk 
Um, the story is that someone gave him that for his 50th birthday to suggest that he was old. Another type of colonial rugose coral that looks a little different because the coralites were not uh, right next to each other. They were not adjoining. Uh, there was a little separation in between them. Um, and we sometimes call these colonial rugose corals finger corals because they're about the width of uh, a finger. And there are many of these in the state house. This is a really nice example from the Broad Street steps. And some of these could be quite large. That mechanical pencil for scale gives you an idea that this one was several feet across. These finger corals can be found on the inside of the state house as well, uh, located right next to portraits of past governors. Uh, and there are many nice ones in the exterior of the building. Another type of extinct coral are the tabulate corals. And these are sometimes called honeycomb corals, probably for obvious reasons, because they look like the structures made by honeybees. In fact, the name Favocytes, which is uh, this coral uh, featured, uh, actually means honeycomb. And it was given to uh, this coral by none other than Jean uh, Baptiste de Lamarck, who is probably more famous for his early theory of biological evolution. Here's a really nice honeycomb coral located right in front of the middle set of doors at the Third Street entrance. Another group that kind of resembles corals uh, are stromatoporoids. So stromatoporoids should not be confused with stromatolites. Stromatolites were blue-green algae uh, that trapped sediment and, and made layered mats. Well, the stromatoporoids also had layers, uh, and they were divided by other structures uh, called pillars. Uh, when you cut a stromatoporoid open, it might look like uh, this one at the right, which has concentric layers. And because of the shape and size of these, um, the old quarrymen used to call them cabbage heads. But they're actually calcareous sponges. So they were filter feeders. They would draw water in um, and extract uh, plankton and organic uh, nutrients from the water uh, and then expel the water. Jacob Markowitz was uh, a geologist who was formerly at Battelle, and he helped me to locate many of the fossils uh, in the state house. And here he is pointing uh, just shy of a large stromatoporoid, so just to the right of where he's pointing. I don't think you can quite reach it. Stromatoporoids like to encrust hard objects, so they'd encrust just about anything and everything that didn't stand still. So at the left is a stromatoporoid overgrowing a horn coral, and at the right is a stromatoporoid overgrowing the shell of a cephalopod. Um, and you can see that, uh, yeah, they would just rapidly overtake things. So finally, we have trace fossils. Trace fossils are not the animal themselves or any part of their body, but rather they record fossil behavior. So these could be burrows or borings or tracks or traces of animals. And in the exterior of the state house, you have abundant trace fossils. Most of these are fairly wide and they uh, branching traces uh, that are um, called Thalassinoides ichno species. Uh, we don't actually know what kind of animal produced these borings but their borings are quite common in some layers of the Columbus limestone. Uh, the quarrymen used to call it a sheepskin, and architects would sometimes call it lamb's wool. And they would actually purposefully use it for uh, prominent exterior surfaces on the state house. Okay, we've seen this slide before, but I just want to remind you sort of where we can find Columbus limestone. So we're going to talk now about some of the places you can see it. So here in central Ohio, I'm very excited about a new metro park that should be opening uh, in the next you know, year or two. 
Uh, this is the Quarry Trails Metro Park. It actually occupies a former portion of the Marble Cliff Quarry. And there are plans to make uh, hiking and biking trails, uh, to have kayaking and even rock climbing on the steep uh, cliff faces. So this is not yet open, but is coming soon. And there's Madison, uh, our graphic artist, uh, finding some fossils. Columbus limestone can actually be seen in many buildings around central Ohio, uh, including probably the most famous building of all, the Ohio Stadium. Now, if you went up to the Ohio Stadium, you won't see a lot of fossils in the wall. And that's because the Ohio Stadium was made from poured concrete, but the concrete <clears throat> was made from Columbus limestone. So we're going to count it. At the right, uh, you could actually see fossils in the stone because this is actually cut stone. Uh, and this is the Bush Mansion, which is now at Prescott Place in Marble Cliff, uh, a suburb of Columbus. So this mansion was built by Samuel Prescott Bush in the year 1900. Uh, he was a leading industrialist and the head of Buckeye Steel. He's the great grandfather of George W. Bush and the grandfather of George H.W. Bush, two of our presidents. Oh, I forgot to say, there are many fine buildings in German Village, uh, mostly houses, um, and in downtown Dublin, where you can also see the Columbus limestone. Kelly's Island is another good place to see it. Um, you may have heard of the famous glacial grooves, which I use for my background. So these are glacial landforms that were excavated into the Columbus limestone. <clears throat> so if you look closely at the grooves, you'll find fossils. In fact, sometimes the fossils actually influence the shape of the glacial landforms. There's a little uh, arrow uh, uh, at the left, red arrow at the left side showing a coral head and uh, the, the water that was under the glacier that was carrying scouring uh, rock kind of actually kind of went around uh, that coral. Kelly's Island State Park, there are some abandoned quarries where you can view the fossils. Of course, being state parks, you're not allowed to actually remove the fossils, uh, but it's a good place to study them. Uh, at, at right are two Stone Lab students who are trying to identify fossils and match them to guides that they have. The Marblehead Lighthouse State Park is another good place uh, to see uh, Columbus limestone and fossils. Uh, here are two large coral, or actually three, well, maybe four uh, large uh, coral colonies. Another place that um, to see the Columbus limestone that I kind of fell in love with is Lakeside Daisy Nature Preserve. Uh, this preserve was actually um, uh, created to protect the lakeside daisy, which is pictured below. Um, and it was created out of a portion of the Marblehead Quarry, uh, which is the last native population of these daisies in the U.S., continental U.S. But um, there are parts of this preserve that were added uh, back in May of 2019 that uh, preserve some wonderful uh, glacial landforms, glacial grooves. Um, uh, there are surfaces with beautiful glacial striations and a lot of fossils. Now this part is not open to the public uh, on a regular basis, uh, but there are periodic hikes offered uh, that go back to the glacial landforms. If you can get in on one of those hikes, I highly recommend it. And finally, many of the large uh, caverns uh, that occur in Ohio, such as Ohio Caverns, Seneca Caverns, and Olentangy Indian Caverns, formed either wholly or partly within the Columbus limestone. So limestone is subject to being uh, dissolved by acidic groundwater uh, and it often forms caverns. Many times the fossils will be obscured by the mineral formations within the cave, such as the stalagmites and stalactites. But if you search carefully, you can find them, such as the horn coral at right. 
So that is all I, that I have. Um, and I wonder if uh, anyone has any questions. Yeah, Mark, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is here from Daniel and he's going back to the trilobites and had a question about those. Um, he says, are the spikes something that they use? Referring to the spikes on the exterior of the trilobites. Uh, yeah, there, there are a lot. The, some of the trilobites were very spiny. <clears throat> and it probably was a deterrent uh, to predators. <clears throat> there were also some, um, some of the spines, excuse me, I'm <clears throat> <clears throat> losing my voice. Uh, some trilobites had large spines um, on the sides of the head. I don't know if you can see, uh, this is a large trilobite isotelis, which had these long genal spines. These were actually thought to help the trilobite with molting its exoskeleton, which it had to do periodically in order to grow. So the Basically, what would happen is the trilobite would dig these spines. It would kind of walk backwards, dig these spines into the sediment, and then keep walking backwards, and the head would come off. And it would basically uh, help the trilobite to get out of its old uh, exoskeleton. But mostly, they were probably used for uh, defense from predators. OK. And then our next question comes from Rose, who's joined us several times in, uh, for previous webinars. But she wants to know if you can find trilobites in Columbus. Yes, you can. Um, so there are um, some creeks, um, especially over near the, um, the Scioto uh, and Olentangy uh, rivers um, that cut through the Columbus limestone. Um, like in, in, in uh, Dublin, there are some creeks there. Um, some of them are on private property is the only thing. So you need to get permission from the landowners to, to collect. But uh, yes, uh, you can occasionally find fairly complete trilobites, but uh, more common are heads or tails. Okay, uh, we have another question from Diane. She asks, is there anywhere in the state where people are allowed to hunt for fossils? I went to Fossil Park in Sylvania, Ohio, and was disappointed. Yeah, so <clears throat> we actually, um, we on our fossil collecting webpage, which we can probably uh, link to in the chat, uh, we list some public sites around Ohio uh, to collect fossils. Uh, the one I really recommend for beginners is Caesar Creek State Park. There is an area on the emergency uh, spillway uh, that is uh, controlled by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, where they allow you to collect fossils with a permit that you obtain from the visitor center. And I understand right now <clears throat> the visitor center may be closed, but you can call them and they will issue a permit by over the phone. But if we put a link to that in the chat, <clears throat> Another good thing to do is actually to join a, a fossil collecting club uh, or a, a rock club near you. And there are some of those listed on our on our fossil collecting web pages too, such as the Columbus Rock and Mineral Society here in Central Ohio, or the North Coast Fossil Club uh, up near Cleveland, or the Cincinnati Dry Dredgers down near Cincinnati. By joining the club, um, you can really learn about some of the secret spots um, and you may get uh, permission to enter places uh, that um, the group has permission to enter that you wouldn't as an individual. Okay, and I, I did share the link to our fossils in Ohio webpage. And another great resource would be the webinar that's coming up at two o'clock, uh, just, just about an hour from now, that's going to be led by Brittany Perrick. And she's going to talk about how to find fossils in Ohio. So I think that's going to be, you just made a great segue to uh, promoting our next Earth Science Week event this afternoon. And I did also share in the chat the link to our Earth Science Week webpage and um, wanted to invite all of those folks out there in attendance right now to check out that page. We've got uh, three more webinars this week, one this afternoon, one tomorrow, and one on Friday. 
And so we've got a lot of great activities coming up to uh, finish off the week. So um, with that, I think we're, we're wrapped up and we made it to an hour. So I wanna thank you, Mark, and thanks to David and everybody out there who uh, joined us today. I hope you enjoyed the uh, talk as much as we did. And we hope to uh, have encouraged you to get out there and explore the Columbus limestone and uh, search for Ohio fossils in general. So we'll wrap it up and say have a great day. Thank you.